Hello everyone and welcome to Chat 19, a podcasty style thingamajig featuring the players you love from Nat 19. Here we'll be delving into some of your most burning questions you've submitted using the questionnaire form in this video's description, as well as on our Twitch page. I am your host, Chase, also known as Coffin Jockey, and I am joined today by some lovely, lovely people. How about you introduce yourselves as well as a little bit of info about your character starting with Izzy. Oh, heck. Uh, okay. Um, well, <laughs> fuck, I'm Izzy. Tell me! Uh, I'm Yamato SFX. Uh, that's what they call me on the YouTubes. I play Flux. Uh, he's a bit of a newer character. But, uh, yeah, he is a warforged uh, artificer from uh, from the land of uh, of High Wave. High and, uh, Wave? He's a big old Ooh. robot boy who builds stuff and tries to be helpful and is a bit awkward. That's fun. Is High Wave in contrast to a, a an implied Low Wave? I think it would be irresponsible for us to assume otherwise. I that sounds correct. All right, I I look forward to to finding uh uh the the warforged that are from low wave. <laughs> I'm sure they're forthcoming. I'm sure that they'll be. They're, they're right around the corner. I'm Where sure. do you think all the phi comes from? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they're all wizards because they're so chill and can study so easily. <laughs> <laughs> Such ridiculous intelligence. Uh, and then we got Aaron. Hello, that's me. I'm Aaron. Uh, some people call me Frozen Frost, but that's not going to be you. I guarantee it. Because no one calls me that, really. <laughs> There's like <laughs> five people who call me that. Uh, I play Mariam Lucius, a tiefling bard fuckboy, who Woo. is a wholesome bean. And I will make you fall in love with him. Or else. Or else. I love it. I'll be honest, the only time I refer to you as Frozen Frost is after I've already said Aaron to somebody who knows many Aaron's. Yes. And that is, <laughs> that is the only time. It's like Aaron, it you know, It is the Frozen secondary Frost. qualifier to Aaron. <laughs> My chat the... doesn't call me Frozen Frost. They call me Aaron. <laughs> I'm, I'm a fan. Oh, good times. Uh, I have a list of many, many questions that have been submitted by... Uh, fans of the show, as well as your fellow players. And the first one of said questions goes a little something. I like this. Dear Miriam of Flux, what do you think your character's theme song would be? Ooh. Heck. I you have gone through feelings? a lot of stuff. I'm going to be real. I spent like nights just going through because I, I listen to music and I try to make playlists for basically every character if I can. Mm -hmm. um, okay, yeah. So I can't say theme song immediately, but I've been going through uh, a ton of instrumental stuff because bardisms. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I really, really love There's a cello cover by. Let's see if I can find it. Um, uh, let's take one second. There it is. Uh, there's a cello cover of Welcome Home uh, by Coheed mm -hmm. and Cambria, done by a cover band called Break of Reality. And oh, it's that awesome. Incredible. That's one I really like for it. Um, but it, honestly, to give you a direct answer of what I would say, it changes on the daily for me. I have to assume Ninja Sex Party's Orgy for One. Um, if I had to do Ninja Sex Party, I'd probably say Wondering Tonight would be my most recent one. <laughs> That's a good time. Oh, that'd, that'd be a good one. <laughs> oh. Is boy, do you have strong feelings about Flux's theme song? Heck. Yeah, normally I, I do kind of the same and try to make a playlist for any character I'm, I'm doing. But Flux has been real difficult. <laughs> Hmm. There are there are surprisingly few songs that seem to speak to like ro all the robot dudes in the audience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Got to get kind of creative. But if we're it's going, so hard if we're to, on a ninja it's so hard to sex... choose between all the all the Daft Punk songs there are. <laughs> I wish I listened to more Daft Punk. <laughs> uh, friggin', if we're if we're going on an NSP track though, uh. Perhaps I don't know what we're talking about, and I haven't for a while. Seems somewhat <laughs> appropriate. 
<laughs> that both of those sound like a real good time. <laughs> oh, heck yeah. I have the next question for Miriam. Hello, it's um, me. Yes. Dear Miriam, did you live with Quintus and his uncle, or did you have your own house or apartment somewhere? Uh, it depends on the timeline, as far as I understand. Mm -hmm. uh, I would have stayed there fairly frequently, but uh, I'm a bard. I would be going to all sorts of places. I I met him through performances, generally at different parties, either by one of his uncles or um, at other places. And once we became better friends, I would have definitely probably frequented there much more frequently. But our relationship became a lot more day-to-day -day around each other, I think, after um, the attack on Riverwind. That's entirely fair. So you moved in, became buds after that point, I assume. Yeah. There's room in the well, castle. That's when Quint started working on his becoming the like member of the Lions Council business, which means effectively taking on the quest that led us here. And uh, at that point, Miriam's like, "No, I gotta, I gotta do something to help this guy. <laughs> he just needs so much help." Oh, it's mostly Mar Marion blamed himself at that point. This is oh, yeah. it, at one point Quintus's dad saved Marion's life, mm -hmm. uh, but in doing so died, and it's one of the reasons Marion blames himself for Quintus's dad's death. But Quintus does because Quintus led an attack that also caused him to have to come save me, and then uh, Raleigh did because Raleigh was possessed and caused the attack that caused Quintus to counterattack that caused his dad <laughs> to have to save me. So <laughs> So we're all at fault. Really. <laughs> it's just a whole mess of guilt. <laughs> so it's less he needs so much help, and it's more we all need so much therapy. That and, you know, he also does need so much help. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it can be two things. The world would eat Quintus alive in some ways if he, uh, if he didn't have someone to look out for him. This That's precious fair. boy who needs to be protected. At all costs. Oh, uh, next question is for Flux. What sort of unique items do you look forward to making? And is there anything in particular you would want to make for your fellow party members? Ooh, I've been thinking about that recently, actually. Like, I would... At first, I was thinking more about, like, making, like, armor and weapons and stuff like that, but it is seeming like it will be way easier to just get someone, like, like them to make, like, a plus one weapon and stuff like that. So I'm thinking of... Mo getting more into like weird utility stuff like i think quintus at one point i'm not sure if it was in character or not said like uh would like a cape of bellowing it's like mm -hmm. it's reasonable i could i could get that done maybe i could draw plans for a cape of bellowing you just gotta but, figure out how to make like a, a warforged warhorse Oh my god, but he already has a warhorse. Yeah, but the, the Warford warhorse is for his warhorse. It's the horse his horse rides into battle. My god. <laughs> Somebody that as important both... as Quintus's horse can't possibly ferry themselves to and fro. Somehow sounds simultaneously badass, adorable, and supremely uncomfortable for everyone involved. <laughs> That sounds it sounds great. I don't know. Maybe make like a horse Segway, like one of those little <laughs> scooters. A little just... horse hoverboard. Yeah, yeah, perfect. There you go. <laughs> oh, that'll, these... that'll piss this, off those mall cops. This, this is a good idea. This needs to happen. Oh, but yeah, it'd be, it'd be fun. Like I think I need to look more into it. But I think Xanathar's guide has like a lot of like really kind of more roleplay centric magic items that'd be really fun to try and make common magic yeah. items are some of the best in the book I yeah think. Mm -hmm. the, that's where you get like a, a who, who one of deco's characters took it uh the the pipe of bubbling i think it's oh no kyra mm -hmm. has it in water deep it they pull it out like once every once in a while but it's literally just up a pipe that if you put it in your mouth it blows bubbles <laughs> oh it does it's such a good oh, time that's wonderful <laughs> This was a uh, one that one that I liked a lot was a Pathfinder item, but uh, it was it was like a variant of the robe of useful items where you like pull off a patch and it makes an item worth like a gold or less, more or less. But that could include food. Uh, it's just whatever you made disappeared an hour after you conjured it. So we called it the robe of infinite snacking. And you would just keep <laughs> pulling off patches and making like a gold's worth of food and just eat it and it would go away in your stomach within an hour. 
and just <laughs> just snack forever. <laughs> oh, no. It's perfect and terrible. <laughs> it was a good time. I'm sure you can make hammers and tools and stuff, but why do that when you could just conjure a whole roast quail, go to town on it, and then it just cleans itself up? <laughs> An entire roast quail. It's fine. Oh my god, it's terrible <laughs> and I love it. Oh. oh, I would like to, I kind of want to see if I can make, like, some kind of, uh, like, boots of levitation or boots of flying. Mm. Just, just be yeah, those are good useful. Time. Because, I mean, like, if, if Flux made them, they're going to be, like, rocket boots. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> be amazing. Here's my wicked boots that look exactly like the atom, but just fire comes out of the wings. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the wings flap, and they don't, they don't, like, lift you into the air. They're just there to cool the engines. <laughs> yeah. It's a very complex, intricate system. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, next question is for both of the boys. Uh, oh. Dear Miriam and Flux, thoughts on Tenebros and Stradivarius, I believe those are how those are pronounced. Future friends, <laughs> maybe? It's obviously only a matter of time before everyone forgives them for the things they've done, after all. That yeah, seems a tad unlikely, but you never know. <laughs> what? No, I'm sure everyone will become fast friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Having no idea what these characters have done, this question is is totally reasonable to me, and I feel like both of you are just resisting change. They're uh, they're the bad behind the bad, um, uh -huh. the the shadowy forces backing our previously assumed a big bad, mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, I, I think that they're gonna be a problem. I don't know how much I can't I can't speak honestly to that. Uh, but we'll definitely end up fighting them. I can't in most universe. We're either gonna disappear, we won't see them for a very, very long time, or at some point we're gonna be like, all right, Duke's up, nerd, and that'll be also bad <laughs> because they're really <laughs> strong as far as I understand. Um, Stradivarius is, uh, as, uh, as speaking as Aaron, I love Stradivarius. <laughs> A whole oh bunch. yeah, <laughs> he's great. Aside from the fact that, uh, like, as the bard who wouldn't uh, know what a Stradivarius is with a T rather than a D, I think is how this one's right. spelled. It's very yeah. close to the violin, but um, he's just boisterous and fun. But I think we're yeah, we're probably gonna kill each other at some point. Yeah, I imagine they're gonna be just stupid strong. Cause I think we're. Was it just one of them is an archdemon, or did they refer to both of them? Tenebros is an archfiend. Uh, archfiend the yeah. uh, Stradivarius is what he's like a high level Abishai, so he's not something to be messed with, mm -hmm. but he's not an archfiend. Yeah. To uh, to give you a little more context, recently found out that uh, the Tenebros was the one who murdered Flux's master and sent him on his whole uh, adventure to meet the party. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, as of right now, um, Issy is very interested in him because he's the Tenebros is basically the first thing that has been able to make uh, Flux feel anger. Ooh. And he doesn't fully know how to deal with that. Like, he academically understands, like, oh, I'm feeling angry. But I've never felt angry before, and it's weird, and I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> That is a good time. So naturally, uh, say in 10 days, maybe 11 tops, you'll everyone will forgive them. Of and course. You'll, you'll go yeah, that seems reasonable. Yeah, Yeah, I, I feel like it's it, right around the corner, I'm sure. I keep developing that gosh darned nuance. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if they can do that after, after what we've seen so far, I'd just be impressed, honestly. <laughs> Uh, that's, I refuse that's... to make friends before they make me explode. <laughs> uh, next question is for Mary. As Quinn's best friend, who among the wife candidates you've met do you think is the best match for them? For Quinn, currently? I mean, Lyra's really interested. They're viciously talented and very pretty. Um... It also helps that they're, uh, they have a Kahulian accent. I don't think they're from Kahulas, but uh, that's 
uh, as far as Miriam's concerned, a very good thing. Um, so yeah, definitely, I think he'd be in good hands with a bard. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, not to mention the fact that he's also viciously interested right out the gate. So there's just an immediate like, yo, we doing this? And uh, I hope they do. Again, I've literally talked in and out of character about like, all right, how do I get a harpsichord or something into Quintus's room so he can pretend that he wants her there for lessons, but we all know, <laughs> including her, that that's not what it's there for. <laughs> and it's an excuse to get them in the room <laughs> and they can go from there. Um, uh, recent events complicate this, but uh, Miriam doesn't know that yet. So we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> so, so far oh. you feeling uh, Lyra? Lyra's best wife candidate. Yeah, I would wife. I would be deep in Lyra. There's no one who's immediately reciprocated Quinn's even mild flirtations at the most part because Quinn's not even Miriam will passively flirt with people and move on with his day, and that's not infrequent, but it's not exactly regular either. Quintus flirting with people is even rarer than that. So when he does, it's been mostly with like Lyra, and. Um, that's been the one he's been the most enthusiastic about. So if you had to ask Miriam, which he'd be like pointing to, that's that's a path to success right there. It's not like he's gonna hunt down Lexi and be like, "Yo, you want to smooch?" <laughs> I will make my ship cannon. <laughs> it will happen. Yes. <laughs> oh, and then you just fill the room with strawberries and hope for the best. <laughs> Uh, Instead of yeah. rose petals on the bed, he just scatters strawberries. <laughs> I think that's counterintuitive. It sounds like a good idea, but she'd just be really she'd be snacking the whole time, and you can get her <laughs> attention. Oh, uh, be impossible to keep her focused on anything else. Mm. Recipe for disaster. I'm about it. Next question is for Flux, dear uh. Flux. You've proven yourself to be very obedient, at least when it comes to the highest standard. If one of them told you to wander off into the woods and never come back, would you? Asking for a friend. 100% without question. Because <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, he trusts whoever he has latched on to as his master and doesn't really see himself as a person. He just sees himself as a tool. So if someone gives him the idea that they need him to go off and just wander into the woods... Yeah, he's got no problem with that. He'll just do it. Okay. 200 years go by, just comes out covered in moss. I'm sure they have a good reason for me to be out here. <laughs> Goodness, I've been at this for a while. I'm so helpful. <laughs> oh, that's, that's fair. I was, I was curious about that as well, since I haven't seen your uh, other interactions with, with the group thus far. So, yeah. It's fair. Like people, like uh, like his master, I think, did her best to instill a certain sense of autonomy. Like she never treated him like a slave, but it's just a very difficult thing for him to wrap his head around. He generally feels much more comfortable when someone is telling him what what he can do to be helpful. Because so often he just doesn't really understand people and their emotions very well. It's like. I would like to have a guide. Just someone tell me what, what I should be doing, please. Hmm. Entirely fair. The next question is for both of you. Dear Flux and him, the man who welts ice, the women want him, the men want him, the Rolex with a diamond ring wear and kiss steal and then wheel and deal and limousine ride and jet fly and son of a gun marry him. If you were to run for High Lord, what would your campaign slogan be? And if you win, what would you do? Huh. Interesting question. Man. That is huh. a loaded one for me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Miriam wouldn't, but if he did, his campaign slogan... Uh... The devil's in the details? I have no idea. Uh, that's so far out of Miriam's thought pattern because he lives in a world where his existence is terrifying to people. It not only reminds them of magic, it reminds them of devils. <laughs> and uh, it would be a hard sell. Uh, what he would do if he got it 
would be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> um, he would probably try and help people in the Electory District um, as much as he can, because he's come from uh, uh, not exactly, like, rich beginnings. And uh, he would... Uh, he would focus on the, the people that really need him versus the people that are already doing plenty fine in the city. Mm. Cool, cool. I think Flux is probably somewhat similar in that running for High Lord would be like the last thing in the universe he would try to do because he has trouble enough <laughs> making his own decisions, much, much less making the decisions for an entire country. But if someone were to somehow convince him to do such a thing, yeah, his platform would probably be somewhere along the lines of robotically making everything run as efficiently as possible and trying to answer absolutely everyone's requests and ordering them in some kind of order of importance. <laughs> Trying to figure, <laughs> figure that out. Because obviously spreadsheets are what's going to make people happy. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, but also, weirdly and sort of uh, paradoxically, he would really want to explore the arts. Because mm. while Flux himself is very robotic, he's fascinated by a lot of things he doesn't understand. So art especially, really, like, he finds it really interesting how, like, people can so easily make things that don't seem to serve, like, a concrete purpose or make much sense. They just created something for the sake of it because, like, they had a, an interesting feeling that they wanted to express. He just, like, he has a hard time wrapping his mind around that, but he's like, I, I want to know more about that. I want to create stuff that's just useless but fun. Hmm. So it sounds like uh, Miriam's slogan is, I represent everything that scares you. <laughs> And Flux's slogan is, I inherently do not understand what you need. <laughs> <laughs> and he would have no qualms about just admitting that. <laughs> like, I am a terrible candidate for this position. You should not hire me. There are better people. <laughs> Thank you. That is all. Just explosive applause right after that. You He's get all so the votes. honest. <laughs> <laughs> I... I don't understand you people. Yeah, they're just becoming like Primus. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Next question is for Marion. Dear your kittiness, how did he do? The man who slightly defrosts ice? The women are interested in him? The men are interested in him? The Casio with a plastic ring wearing hugs stealing than wheeling and dealing but in an appropriate amount? A Ford Fiesta ride an economy class flying cousin of a knife, Quintus. How did he do? He did. He did real good. He That's uh, good. he he nearly won. I mean, he uh, he got darn close. Um, he fought some of the tournament, and what I think Mark Wire was left with like seven HP at the end. It was Ooh, yeah, it was uh, so close. Like that is. A few dice rolls if they were slightly higher, and that would have been it. Uh, I, I, I talked about it during game. I'll say it again now. I like if this were the movie moment, and I was writing the script. This is where they would double knock out, and mm -hmm. it would cause an entire problem with the uh, administration of the tournament. As I don't know, at that point, the deal would have to be like con save to see who can keep on their feet the longest because they're <laughs> technically the winner. And uh, it would be. Uh, a blast. It was really, really good, and I, I, I Aaron, bet a, basically all of my money on him because uh, I <laughs> believed he can do it, and Mariam did because he didn't care if he could or not. He's like, no, this is what we do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, Lost and, a lot uh, of money on that fight. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> easy come, easy go. Yeah, Mary's not going to sweat a couple hundred gold. He gave away 50 platinum immediately. He's like, you know who would like this? Mom. <laughs> Santa <laughs> uh, It's, um, yeah, he did fantastic. Heck yeah, that's good. I didn't know that he actually uh, fought Murkwire. That's a yeah, good time. Was, uh, 
in the this would be the what, quarterfinals. Yeah. Yeah, because they're moving into semis now. They were in the quarterfinals, and uh, him and Marquardt went at it, and it was it, it was looking bad. But he brought it back, and it was down to the wire at the last second. More like down to the Marquardt. Anyway, who's left in, this, in the semifinals? On the semi, what it would be the lady. Fenris, Vogan, and um, Merkwai. And Merkwai. Hey, that'll be a good time. That's gonna be gnarly. It's gonna get so heated. More people to fight Merkwai and risk him <laughs> Ooh. Oh shit! You're right. <laughs> I keep forgetting that's a factor. Yeah, that's that's yeah. a that's a risky situation. <laughs> um. So was it? Correct me if I'm wrong, but was there a character named uh, King Von Haku that was in the tournament? Yep. Yeah. King I remember was, hearing uh, a lot of hype about them. Him and Vogan had a fight uh, in the semifinals, mm -hmm. and that was another one that was really down to the the flat end of it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that that was probably I'd say the most anime fight out of all of them <laughs> in the. Uh, you know, they they basically had heckin' summon spirits fighting over them. Qu uh, Quinn had a very similar thing. Like it was, it was a very cinematic semifinals uh, or quarterfinals across the board. Um, but yeah, it was uh, a lot of clashes of ideals because even in university, the tournament picked these fights rather than it just being random <laughs> lot. Uh, based on the relationship between combatants, and they noticed that Keen loathes Vogan, mm. and Keen went outright to try and um, attack him in every possible way he could during their fight. Goodness, he didn't want to. He didn't want to beat Vogan. He wanted to crush Vogan, and it was mm -hmm. great. Was it like a if he had the opportunity, he would kill him kind of fight? Uh, I think that was on the table. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think he would care very much if uh, if it happened. I don't. It, uh, by the end of the fight, whether or not he would have hesitated, I can't say. But he definitely talked game like he was ready for it. He wouldn't care about jail. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, diggity dang! All right then. What a good time. That's that sounds like a pulse pounding heck in tournament, and I'm excited for more. Uh, next question. Is for Flux. <laughs> and I don't have the context for this, but I will ask it as though I do. Dear Flux, now that you have a human face, <laughs> when are you going to be hitting the dating scene? <laughs> Wife? Yo, I will be so happy if that somehow makes sense. There was a, there was a time when I think it was, uh, yeah, <laughs> Miriam Flux and, uh, and, uh, Lexi, yeah, we're all uh, tailing Fenris, just basically for fun, just seeing what she was up to through town. And uh, mm -hmm. Mary amused all herself to, uh, you were just like trying to look human, right? Or just, yeah. Stuff. yeah. And uh, Lexi can obviously do the same. So Flux was just like, I can cast alter herself and mm -hmm. decided to make himself look human. But mm -hmm. I thought it would be funny that because his Warforged face can't emote in any meaningful way, I decided that, like, he just doesn't have the muscle memory to work a human face. So when he <laughs> became human, he basically just had this rictus grin and, like, wide eyes, just completely unmoving and completely unsettling. And, so uh, dating scene's right around the corner. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, who's not going to be into that? <laughs> Permanent bedroom I, eyes. I uh I can't imagine a scenario where Flux would come up with that idea. It would I imagine if it did, it would probably be something like Miriam thinking it would be funny to take him clubbing or something like that. Because if he was asked by someone, he would do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <sighs> would, uh, I would love to see Flux try and hit on people. <laughs> What would Flux dance like? That actually came up. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was a whole dance contest. Yeah, we were, we were at a party and an impromptu dance contest came up. And mm -hmm. uh, basically a lot of dubstep. 
a lot, a lot of doing the robot and just like working his limbs at angles that no, no human joints could muster. Okay, sure, that's that's great for flux, but what about human flux? Ah, uh, yeah, I imagine until he was perhaps criticized, he would make absolutely no adjustments. He would just look <laughs> like his arms and legs are just ripping themselves out of its their sockets. Moving faster that than That might actually be more work. impressive, because people Turns. might think you're some sort of contortionist. <laughs> Dancing is much more painful when I'm a human. <laughs> Why is this? <laughs> oh, yeah, because when he's using Alter Self, it's like actually turning him into a human, so that would hurt like hell. <laughs> is this I, what I have is? lost my ability to dance. <laughs> All my dance moves cause incredible pain. What am I if I cannot dance? I am nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that was that was a really fun time. <laughs> that that does sound like a very good time. Uh, Next question is for both of you. Dear Merriman Flux, do you have any guesses at who the Merchant Lord Vindy's withheld candidate for High Lord might be? If so, do you feel they have a better or worse chance than Murkwire? If you have no guesses, is there anyone you'd prefer to see to be this mysterious candidate, or perhaps anyone further you would not want to see as a candidate? Hmm. I have no guess. Uh, I've, I thought about it a couple times, but at this point, I just don't have enough of an idea of what to go on. Um, yeah. If I had to pick, Argo. <laughs> okay. Fair. Argo would be great. Is He's... that a pick that? Uh, is that a pick that you think they would pick, or a pick that you would like? I. I know she's aware of Iocane, uh, clearly. Uh, I have no reason to believe she would actually pick Argo. I would pick that because, A, I think it'd be funny watching him absolutely attempt to refuse it because he would no way would be <laughs> interested. He'd be like, no, that's not what I do. Talking is all I'm good at. And Vindy would say something like, oh, great. Well, talking's all you'll have to do. Let's go. <laughs> and um, uh, I think he would do a good job. Honestly, uh, Argo is uh, an attentive person, and I think he could do it. It's just getting him to do it would be the entire <laughs> turnaround on that ad adventure. Yeah, that'd be a whole thing. V Vindy was uh, the one who gave uh, who gave Vogan the key to the basement, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I don't I don't have like a real guess, but considering like how much she seems to kind of do things just to see what'll happen, just kind of a little bit of uh, out of boredom, kind of giving that vibe. Like, what What if she, like, endorsed Vogan just to see what would happen? Because, <laughs> uh, I mean, be interesting. she already tried to make him give a speech. Yeah, uh, I, I couldn't tell you. I know that the other High Lords know who they've nominated, so they've already nominated them. They haven't revealed it is the big thing. True. So she would have decided on this a while ago. Yeah. She would have had to have locked in on him early if that were the case. Yeah. Uh, which, again, is still possible. She could have just either already known things that she um, confirmed while working with him. But uh, that's not something I would immediately jump to. She's a hard person to peg down. We don't know a ton about Vindy, as, as is other than she enjoys being entertained and... Uh, she has her secrets. Mm -hmm. I imagine I, Vogan would just have a panic attack if that were announced. Oh yeah, he'd be like, "No, I'm, I'm leaving. Goodbye." <laughs> <That's> <laughs> he, yeah, country. I can't. I'd see no world in which he would accept it either. He's got his pilgrimage thing going on. I'd be like, "You're the High Lord. You can't leave town." He'd be like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> "Just run for the gate." <laughs> <laughs> Who's oh. gonna stop me? Screams Vogan, <laughs> sprinting. <laughs> I can't believe Vogan learned Bonkai. <laughs> yeah, no, I, uh, I, I don't believe it will be him. No, uh, definitely it's, not. But it's it's tricky to pick down. There's no one I immediately meet that it jumps out at me as someone who would be Vindy's favorite pick, but uh, I could very well be wrong. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Secondary to if it couldn't be Argo, it'd be Rory. Hmm. We basically have only talked to him like three or four times, but that would just be a very weird out there pick. And it also won't be him because I don't think Vindy knows he exists, 
But I would love it if it was. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to pick something wild just to stir the pot. Yeah, well, it's the the thing is, is that she's clearly out for, in, I, she said it herself to Vogan, it's like she's here for entertainment. She's uh, an old woman thinking about retirement. She wants to have fun and she's bored. So Vogan was an interesting pick. She picked him because he was different, not because he might have been her best choice, but because it would be the most interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, so when thinking about what Vindy might go after, you have to think about what would make the biggest splash, regardless of if they win, the nomination being a big deal mm -hmm. is probably more what she's after. Vindy, I think, is playing games. Yeah. Makes me think she's probably not going for, like, Edra again. No, no, absolutely no. not. Uh, the, she's Sadly. already nominated someone other than Edrigan. Mm, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, so all the nominations have been locked in. Edrigan, Merquire, and someone else. We don't know. That so, name. question: Who do you think would make a bigger splash if that was the nomination, Bogan or Miriam? Between the two of us, yeah, uh, Bogan. Uh, while Miriam's a tiefling, and that is uh, an immediate place for distrust amongst people in, uh, well, in everywhere. Um, the uh, they're still around frequently enough that while still alien, there are especially places like Summergrass, people will have seen one or two in their times. You have blisters around, but a hobgoblin, uh, Logan's been masked the entire time he's been in the city up until the end of his fight with Keen. Because had he just been walking around unmasked, the guards would likely attack on sight. It's a very different place of distrust. Uh, they would immediately jump to violence. So having something that's normally reviled as a enemy creature uh, of like an opposing army at the best of places, or just something to be exterminated in the worst of times, um, a, a hobgoblin would be an insane pick for Highlord. Absolutely. Gotcha. Agreed. Okay. Yeah, that's fair. Next question is for Flux. Huh. Dear Flux, you approach the world with a kind of childlike naivete. Going by the memories you can currently recall, how old do you think you are? I've thought about that, yeah. Like, like a lot of that childlike naivete is because he's only basically, he only has like seven years or something worth of memory, so everything is still very new in a lot of ways. But in terms of how old he literally is, like, I think we're talking like thousands of years. Yeah. He, uh, he thankfully wasn't conscious for a lot of that but uh yeah I, I do wonder a lot of the time like how how long he was operational before he was locked in a vault for like who knows how long in the during the pre-simonian empire mm -hmm. so like mental age of like seven they're about Physical like age of countless <laughs> yeah like a seven year like we're talking like a like what? Like a seven-year-old prodigy, like someone who, like, like a, with like a master's degree in engineering, but still seven. Mm -hmm. So they they're very intelligent in a lot of ways, but they have huge gaps. A lot of it being social. Gotcha. And, uh, okay. I'm curious if uh, if there ever ever come up in the in the uh, campaign where he'll regain some of those memories. Be very mm -hmm. curious to see what he was up to back then. Well, based on the Chekhov's gun philosophy, if you find a gun in a drawer on the first act, you leave it in the drawer. It's safest yeah. there. Indeed. It's the most interesting option. You, le you leave it's it. You don't, you don't fire that. Yeah. That's, that's, that's probably a felony or something. That stays in the drawer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, gotta, gotta be responsible. Gun safety is very important. I agree. Uh, next question is for him. Dear him, Rolexes, etc. During the whole incident with this necklace breaking thing, you seemed, I don't want to say suicidal, except I do. It was suicidal. What's the deal with that? Uh, it's not suicide. Um... Uh, Miriam, especially in his current position, has to understand uh, that he's he's on a very dangerous person's bad side and someone who can send a kill squad across countries and pull enough strings with the nobility that they don't, like, 
give it any scrutiny uh, is dangerous enough, but someone who can apparate and kill him in a moment is uh, is the secondary thing he knows about the Crystal Queen. Um, so when uh, Miriam's necklace uh, of proof against detection location just stopped functioning for a brief instance recently, and uh, he very much took that as, oh, I'm about to die. <laughs> and uh, he was at home with a couple other people and he told them to leave. So it was less suicide and more, if they came and tried to fight with him, someone was going to die. Miriam has a very brief chance of disabling the Crystal Queen. A very brief, if he uses any of his disables and they somehow work, he can get maybe a minute, he can turn invisible, he can fly away, he has options. But if there's a group, he can't let them die, especially because the reason she's mad is entirely because of him. So if Lexi bit it, like Fenris would be out for blood. Aside from the fact that she'd also be stricken with a vicious amount of grief and guilt behind that, it, it just would be the worst possible scenario. The same thing with Avi, who has nothing to do with it. Um, and the Crystal Queen wouldn't be the kind of person who's like, oh, yes, I'm just here for him. They'd be like, no, nah, let's demolish the building real quick. <laughs> like, there, it would be... I would be surprised if there was anyone left standing or if the building was left standing. Uh... I think she would make a very big mockery out of it, and she would make a, a message out of Miriam. So if he had to die, he was willing to. He ex expected to more than anything, because, my god, does she have legendary resistances? Of course she does. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but uh, he, he was not willing to let people unrelated die because of him having fun. That makes sense. So is there... Is there anything else off the top of your head that would make you react as seriously as that made you react? Thinking of it, something his fault. Like, he, uh, Miriam's a whimsical person. That's, I don't think, a secret to anybody. Uh, he can play most things very casually or by ear, and he's not hyper invested in getting overly serious about it. But, in the same way that he believes Quintus' dad died because it's his fault. His dad died protecting Miriam, which is why Miriam is here. Miriam never, probably never would have came had he not had this just soul racked with guilt over the fact that he it didn't murder, but caused the death of his best friend's dad. And now his best friend's going on a weapon, well, he didn't know, but a quest for an artifact that's been stolen by a bandit lord. He's like, no, nah, I need to go. Like, he, he definitely directly asked to go because he wants to fix his own messes. So it, it seems to be more a uh, more an issue of if somebody else that doesn't deserve to be is within the line of fire for something that you could prevent. Yes, he. I mean, he'll always try and help people. Um, specifically, we, to get him to react as, as he did here is uh, in the same way that we're true or not, like looking at it objectively, uh, he blames himself for some things. And in this case, he he broke a queen's bed after having sex on it, and then stole a legendary artifact from a vault in her palace before running away after shattering, uh, after his friends shattered a prison of hers, releasing all sorts of things she hated and taking one of her prisoners, or four of her prisoners away. <laughs> um, she has Everett met, and she, I'm sure, is generally upset with the party, but she barely knows most of us exist. So for the most part, I'm sure she's kind of over that. But the the armor that I'm wearing is to a degree, depending on how much we can un believe the lore now, if you gather enough of them, wish granting, like it is a big deal. Um, it is artifact level rarity and I just yoinked it. <laughs> I was like, yep, bye. <laughs> and so that's, Dang. I think, more what she's pissed off about than anything else. But because of that, Miriam is always going to be a target. And if other people get hurt because of that, that's on Miriam. It's not really on anyone else at this point. He's now the central focus of that ire. Mm -hmm. 
That is fair. So it's basically got to definitely be life or death before you start to tone down the whimsy. Uh, yeah, he tries to keep it casual. And I mean, Miriam's really good at keeping up that face. He's a bard. He, you have a stage face. Um, but that was just a bit of that falling away for a second. He's like, no, this is no longer cool. Um, you guys need to go. <laughs> mm -hmm. I get that. Next question is for Miriam and Flux. Having seen what happens with idolic arms, such as Vogan's, are you now worried about the rest of the party's arms, such as Quintus and Lexi, especially considering how long Quipcat has been around? What about the Constelliquaries? Do you think something similar will happen with them? Hmm. I, I think, yeah, the idolic arms, those are definitely going to break at some point. I I don't think with, like, the... The Consteliquaries. I think those are probably safe. Those I seem can like, one hundred percent guarantee the Consteliquaries are not going to do that. Um, specifically, they don't react to the Idolic Arms doing anything like that. They are blessed with a level of divinity, but they are artifact level items. Any Consteliquary, they are um, adjacent but not the same. And that would be the reason, like, Miriam saw none of the kaiju battle stuff that was happening during some of the uh, recent battles in the quarterfinals. And uh, that's because he doesn't possess an idolic arm. Uh, if we're talking about them shattering, I'm not, I think the, if one will shatter or lose its power, it will be Lexi's. She's had it for a while and she's been using it fairly frequently. Um, but I also believe she shares alignment with the creature she got it from, which I know helps. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm interested to see, but I can't say anything else. Quipcat, I don't think is going anywhere. I think Quipcat is going to be a, a, a labor of love for Deco and Quintus <laughs> uh, as he battles to make his shield love him. Um, hmm. But uh, that'll be a while coming. I think he's he's only really used it what he used it in the battle where I died he to get back up to the roof of the church and then he's used it in the tournament and that's basically it. Like he hasn't been using it much at all. He's only had it for what a day and a bit. Yeah, it's two days. <laughs> like still he, have quite a few uses in it, I think. We've had Lexi's since uh, since the Esper, which has been a lot longer at this point. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's been a very long time. Yeah, yeah and we haven't uh, gotten any. But again, I think that that alignment attunement is a big thing. Sorry, I interrupted you. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no problem. Um, I was just saying we haven't really heard any like rumblings of uh, that would make us think that uh, Lexi's idolic arm is even kind of like cracking or anything like that, right? that I'm aware of. Not that I've seen, no. Yeah. Because, yeah, she overall, like, she's had it for a long time, but she uses it pretty sparingly, all things considered. Whenever she can. But it's, uh, yeah, she's had it for, what, uh, let's see, most of a month at the very least. Hmm. Yeah, something like that. It's been a little bit. A little bit. So, yeah. which, based on the phrasing of this question and both of your reactions to it, because I haven't uh, been aware of anything, uh, did something break that shouldn't have? Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. Um, Vogan got a sword off of one of the uh, um, idolos we were fighting uh, a while back, and it, uh, it it's a very good sword, and he used the heck out of it, but he used it in basically every fight after he got it, because it's a great ability. Yeah. Um, it's, it's mechanically fantastic. It's just an AOE lightning bolt. Yeah. And, uh, not to mention he can absorb lightning and get, turn it into, what, temporary HP. So he was hitting himself with it and being like, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was a fantastic strat. And, uh, during his fight with Keen, while they were going at it, Keen was talking about how his, uh, uh, his idolic arm hated him to some degree because clearly it hadn't bonded with him enough that he uh, he could use it, and it shattered when Vogan would have lost, but when your idolic arm uh, is trying to escape you, if you die or drop to zero HP, it will break, 
give you a boost of stamina. Your HP will spike by, I can't remember how many, it was, it's basically like a potion of supreme healing, I think. Superior supreme, I think. Something like that. It's a lot. Mm -hmm. um, probably, I'll say supreme for safety, but it could be less than that. And uh, he, uh, you get that, and then it's gone. Um, but uh, as they kept fighting after that, it, uh, it slowly came back and morphed into uh, his new mask, which lets him summon that sword now. Mm. Nice. Very briefly, but he can occasionally use it now. Mm -hmm. And like one of its abilities just became like an ability he had, right? Uh, he can use the uh, lightning rose, that AoE lightning bolt. Um, oh, I think it's on his own, like once a day. I'm not sure what the yeah, actual mechanics are, but right. yeah, it's separate from the sword now. It's now part of him so long as he's wearing mm -hmm. the mask. Dang. That's pretty dang cool. It doesn't Ooh, sound like there were massive asked. consequences for that breaking, other than that he doesn't have it now, though. In his case, it was Keen being wrong about it. Um, it uh, it wasn't super resisting Vogan at any point. It uh, it shattered, but I think it was also attuning to him in a different way. Mm. Um, okay. But it's a lot of that, I think, was setting up the fact that the idolic arms that we have, which we now have, what, three of, I think? We got Alexis, Vogans, and do we have any others? Alexis, Vogans, the shield. Oh, and Quipcat, of course. Yeah, Quipcat. Um, <laughs> uh, I think it's setting up a, a larger scale floor for the players to be aware that if they don't attempt to make progress with idolic arms as they get them, then they may explode. But also that explosion could be useful. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a mixed yeah. bag. Yeah, that's fair. Somet sometimes you have to decide how disposable your magic item is. I see. Okay. I I was concerned for a second that if you broke an idolic arm, the idolos would just be free. And that sounds uh, that, like a uh, way worse situation. When you when you take out the uh the uh I it was the idolos or the guts, the, the idolos. When yeah. you take out an idolos, you get the heart and the idolic arm. The arm is separate from the uh, idolos itself. So if it shatters, it's like a basically a copy of it that's imprinted onto whatever mm -hmm. gear they give you. Um, the heart itself, you can also turn into uh, different effects. Because uh, that actually came out. Uh, Murkwire had the uh, the heart of the same creature that Vogan had the sword of. Mm -hmm. And he used its power to fight Vogan, or to fight Quintus. Uh, um, and uh, he, I believe, could have, and he would have been way not kosher, but he could have used that heart, I believe, to summon it, if I remember right. But now at some point, that heart will just, on its own, turn back into the Idolos. Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, then, you know, if whoever's around at that point needs to deal with the problem because it's probably yeah. going to be a little pissed off. Yeah, I believe it. A little bit. A little bit. Oof. Yeah, that's fair. Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, next question is for Flux. What is your dream invention? Ooh. Dream invention. God, there's so many possibilities. Sky's the limit. Oh, if I could make anything. It'd be really cool if we could, like, make some kind of, like, vehicle for the party. Mm -hmm. Like, if they could somehow, like... Put it to the horseless cart. <laughs> <laughs> or if we, like, made some sort of, like, airship. Mm. Like, oh, uh, if, if, like, the world really, like, opened up and we could just, like, fly places, like, that'd be real neat. Discover have, like, a and mobile repair base. an old spell jammer hall. Like, right? Like, oh, my <laughs> God, that'd be amazingly cool. Would you ever want to try to make something with a chunk of the Nidolos? That'd be an interesting prospect. I, I feel like... Flux would need a lot of specialized knowledge before he could even attempt that. But there's nothing wrong with experimenting, though. Like, if they could somehow make sure that, like, <laughs> there would maybe be some, uh, some checks and balances in place in case, you know, whatever he does instantly summons the idol. Could maybe, uh, see what, uh, see what's possible. But, God, most of that stuff seems so beyond the realm of mortals that, like, Messing with it seems 
irresponsible and possibly suicidal. But I would be lying if I said it would didn't seem like a cool thing to try. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, it sounds like there's plenty of these things around. Uh, I, I'm not saying they're so common that just anybody could have them. They're like, you know, legendary hero status thing. But there's a lot of legendary heroes from the sound of it. Y'all have three of these things in your party already. Uh, mm -hmm. And one of them broke. So, like... It doesn't sound so far-fetched that at a certain point you might be able to work with something like that. It's true, and we have, like, heard, like, a couple of times that, like, the range of power between Eidolos can vary hugely. Like, Raleigh's, uh, patron is an Eidolos that's super fucking powerful, but, like, we could probably find, like, an Eidolos that's, like, the peak of... I don't know, like a like a squirrel or something, or something <laughs> relatively not dangerous. So, like, even if it got free, we could just have everyone tank it. Perfect. <laughs> it's got just enough risk that you can make something slightly useful. Yeah, it starts small. Make yeah. sure we do this kind of thing safely. <laughs> it's a so. squirrel idolos, and you make a bag of holding by stuffing things in its infinite cheeks. Oh my god, that's adorable. <laughs> uh, oh. so yeah, okay. I, I hope that exists I, somewhere. I don't know, squirrel. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure it's it's not only possible, but definitely exists. Definitely. Totally. Uh, greatest nemesis. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Next question is for both of my boys. Uh, dear Miriam and Flux. If each of you had won the matches you lost in, uh, Miriam versus Quintus and Flux slash Liar versus Keen slash Murkwire, how far do you think you would have gone, you could have gone in the tournament? Hmm. I honestly don't think I would have gotten much farther, even if I had won against Murkwire and Keen. Uh, cause... Cause, uh... Flux doesn't have, like, any kind of idolic armaments, and it seems like those are coming in incredibly clutch in the later rounds. And he definitely doesn't have enough charisma to to gain the favor of, uh, of the Merchant Lords. Mm -hmm. So I think even if he had won, he probably would have been on his own. I, th I think he would have gotten incredibly lucky to win the, the match he did win, or that he, that he lost. And then he probably would have immediately lost the next one. Because <laughs> if he That's had to fight someone fair. like Vogan. Oof. I'm trying to remember Quintus's partner, but with relative confidence, I'd say at least the quarterfinals. His name is Quinn. Um, the, when you had uh, the partner rounds, that's where Miriam is effectively a god as far as a partner can be. He's <laughs> um, full support. I can disable one of them. If I could land one Tasha's hideous laughter and they don't snap their teammate out of it. That just leaves me and my teammate to just beat the crap out of whoever else is with them. Um, uh, the quarterfinals, that's where things start really getting hairy. There's people that are obviously gonna be a major problem for Miriam. Um, people like uh, Vogan and the lady. Uh, Lexi would be a nightmare for um, any any rogue really is a nightmare for Miriam to fight because cool. unless I can disable them immediately, uh, they uh, they will sneak attack me once and I'll explode with my soft barred juices. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, but uh, yeah, I think at least quarter, uh, maybe semi if uh, if I got the right matchup. Like uh, Merc Wire would be tough because heat metal would not really do as much to him. Um, right. Yeah. He's a dragonborn. He's a red dragon. Well, he's a obsidian dragonborn, but he's got the resistances to fire, and that would make that a bit more of a pain. Uh, I probably that's a tough. Ma I'd say I'd rather fight Fenris immediately, but the longer I think about that, the more I'm like, I don't know if I would though. But I think out the gate, I would have an easier time messing with her than I would with uh, with someone like Markwar. And the lady, I think, would just annihilate me. I don't think, I don't yeah. in any universe currently believe Miriam has a shot at beating her in a one on one fight. Yeah. Oh, she it seems so sounds too powerful. Go for it. Sorry, I cut you off. What was that, Izzy? Oh, no, I was just saying, yeah, you're right. She seems so powerful. Like, I'm not sure 
of like any individual person that I think Flux could have definitely beaten. Well, like if she player. cranked out that haste magic uh, that she used. Uh, I, I've actually forgot my name. I have to pull my notes up to see if I can find it. But mm -hmm. she's got her crazy super haste. I'm like, nah, that would. Oof. Assuming I don't have, and I don't have to spell magic, and assuming I don't counterspell it. Um, yeah, that that would be that would be Miriam very quickly. <laughs> Yeah, it, it sounds like just about everybody that's made it to the spot in the tournament they're in right now is was more or less going to wind up somewhere near there anyway, uh, mm. regardless of what their matchups were, uh, because of, you know, Idolic Arms and Concealer Queries, etc. That those seem exceptionally powerful. Even in the team rounds, there's been a the few really tight matches that, like, uh, mm. Lexi, Lexi nearly dominated um Fenris's team um early on like when they when they fought it was to the point that like Brett was almost a little upset because it seemed really one-sided and then cleric started clericking and <laughs> surprised they're quite hard to kill um, yeah. but uh yeah it, I think Lexi could have done um really well had she passed there that was basically a coin toss at that point. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the coming up to just before the quarters and after, yeah, most of the people that were going to make it definitely uh, have fought and earned their way forward. Yeah, I was going to say there's, there's like a couple of switch picks, such as, you know, Quinn maybe beating Murkwire, uh, Keen yeah. maybe beating yeah. Bogan, because uh, those are both real close matches, as you had said. Uh, down to uh, even with Fenris, all of them were down to like a few HP, basically on either. Um, like seven HP left on Murkwire as Quintus took, I think it was two points of damage that dropped him below zero. He was down to his last HP and had he, I think he critted his last attack. So if he had done like two or three more damage on two of his crits where he rolled low on, uh, that would have been Murkwire. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's real, real close. That's real close. No yeah, that's that's fair. I think I think that I think you both picked fairly conservative spots in the tournament, but fair spots to to wind up in. Uh, I got the next question. <laughs> Me, the you. first one out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you you did awesome, bro. I'm, I I am I am in no way. I I'm very uh I I am quite happy with where I've ended up. It's been a good time. <laughs> Got all the Sisketti that you can dream of. Huh. Uh, next question is for Mariam. Uh, dear Mariam, uh, love doesn't seem to be your game, at least not a singular love. That said, you're devoted to Quintus. Would you say that among those you've been with, physically or otherwise, is Quintus the closest you've come to loving someone as a brother, a no. friend, or perhaps more? Uh, Mariam's been in love, um, but... He, uh, as a brother, I guess, as a descriptor, is a lot closer to how he feels about Quintus. Uh, Quintus is his best friend, and he would absolutely die for Quintus. Um, but, yeah, Miriam, no one that you've seen in the campaign would be someone that Miriam would describe himself as being in love with. Okay. Uh, loving is a different term. He, he loves everyone, but he's not in love with anyone. <laughs> Is that character that Miriam's been in love with uh, a little spoilery to talk about? Yep. Okay. Ha, ha, ha. Then, yeah. We'll figure that out later. <laughs> Not gonna spill that tea? No, those nope. beans will stay <laughs> firmly within their can. <laughs> oh. That'll be, I'll, I'll, I'll look forward to being able to ask questions about whoever that person might be in the future, hopefully. If they ever come up. Oh, we'll make sure of it. We'll wring it out of you. <laughs> Every last drop. Uh, That's what she said. Uh, oh. Next question is also from Marion. <laughs> New Marion, what are all the instruments you can play? All the instruments off the top of my head? I've been on my Citroen for so darn long. Uh, I don't even really remember. Uh, off the top of So I, I know I can play the mandolin. I think I chose the flute and what else? Um, well, let me go take a look. 
Uh, I believe it was a, I believe it was the piano, the harpsichord was another one I picked. I wanted a large stationary instrument that mm -hmm. Miriam could do at more fancy parties where he wouldn't be able to bring something himself. <laughs> Uh, but he can kind of play it. I mean, that's the, that's the best part about being a bard is even with instruments I'm not proficient in, I'm half proficient in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. I can kind of play it all. Um, but those would be the ones he'd be the best at. That's fair. That's totally fair. Next question is for Flux. Huh. Dear Flux, did your master find you or make you? She found me in a vault. Yeah. yeah. One of her passions is like archaeology and like learning things about the, the pre simonian Empire from like old ruins and such. And one day she uh, she unearthed one of the vaults and uh, there were a bunch of old Warforged in there, but Flux was the only one that was salvageable. So uh, she fixed them up and brought them back online. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they've been so more, they of were a, together. more of a repaired kind of situation than a maid. Yeah, situation. exactly. Yeah, there are there are um, like first generation Warforged and second generation Warforged. Uh, Flux is first generation, so he was made like in times long forgotten and unearthed uh, at some point in the present. But there are uh, there are uh, second gen Warforged that were made trying to copy that technology in the modern day. Mm -hmm. How yeah. old are the second generation Warforged? Roughly, give or take. Oh, huh, I, I don't actually know. Uh, shit. Yeah, I never, I never thought to ask that specific question. If they're like a more recent invention, or if, uh, if they've been around for a while, I would, I would have yeah. to ask Logan about that. But yeah. uh, let's just make some shit up and say that all second uh, generation Warforged are, uh, twenty four years old. Which would hypothetically give them m many more years of memories than Flux has presently. Despite thousands of years <laughs> of age, <laughs> technically, yes. <laughs> it's a weird uh, system. That's fine, I'm sure. <laughs> that's a good time. Dear Miriam and Flux, what do you think you... What do you think about... Uh, I'll get there. What do you think about the other as spellcasters? Do you think the two of you can learn from each other? Oh. I do actually think that, like, Flux would be very interested to talk to Miriam because, like, your, your magic revolves around, like, art and music, and that's something that he doesn't understand but wants to. So it'd be like, I... I think they'd have, he'd have a lot of fun swapping notes. Like, I I create magic by, like, building a machine that is capable of casting spells, but you do it with, like, musical instruments. Like, how does that work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there would be a, uh, a large interest in understanding how the other does magic. Um, from Marion's point of view, it, magic is... At this point, more second nature than anything. It's not quite like a sorcerer where it's in it. He learned it, but it comes through music and through performance. And um, there's not a, a direct, immediate study. That's something he had to do extra, extracurricular effectively, which is why I gave him expertise in Arcana, because he's interested in the secrets of magics and things. I've, uh, I've toyed with the concept of actually multiclassing into wizard at one point. Um, just so I can steal more spells from things. <laughs> um, but I have yet to really commit to that because I really want to get my second layer of expertise and magical secrets first before I even think about that. So I'm going to be barred for a lot longer before that becomes a possibility. Fair, fair. Uh, well, that's level 11, I think. Yeah, we got a ways to go. Oh, yeah, um, that's going to be a and while. Assuming I at level 12 choose, I probably won't. I think a pure bard is going to be Miriam. Yeah, I mean, once you hit a certain point, you get some diminishing returns on multi-class. You generally want to get, like, it's a three-level max. With spellcasting, it's not so bad, because if you do a full caster into a full caster, you don't lose out on spell slots. It means I, I can still get ninth-level spells. 
Okay. Um, if I did like rogue or something, unless I did a three level dip to get arcane trickster to get the one caster level that would let me get a one ninth level spell at 20th level. And I'm Ooh. just not, I want it as soon as I can because ninth level spells are sick. And I, you know, this is assuming we get there. Yeah, um, sure, we'll sure. get there. I have to, uh, I, we'll I also <laughs> talk about how I'm going to die every other session because, uh, Miriam has done a great job at getting iced so far. Everyone else has done a great job at stopping him from getting iced, but <laughs> uh, you know the clock's ticking, and um, soul decay is eventually going to be a problem. Oh no! <laughs> Don't talk like that. We need to keep you alive forever. Oh, I mean, I'm going to do my best <laughs> to survive. But if again, like, if you give the option for Miriam to die to save Quintus or something, he'd mm -hmm. probably do it. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, same. Don't worry. I'm sure one of these days I'll refer to Mariam as uh, he who got iced instead of he who melts ice. <laughs> he who got iced, though. I... Once wheeling and dealing. <laughs> I can't Buried wait with I can a get... Rolex and diamond ring. <laughs> can't wait until I can take third level spells and I'll also know Revivify just in case. <laughs> <laughs> Better be I there to, within that's 60 actually seconds. One thing I, without getting too distracted, uh, one thing I love and hate about bards is I have to be so choosy with my spells. It mm. is, uh, because unless I'm getting like a magical secrets level, I rarely get more than one spell a level. Um, and it's always, uh, like, uh, looking at everything else I have, me like, what am I missing in my kit? Mm -hmm. Because yeah. if I choose the wrong thing, that's life and death for a bard. Yeah. Such a hard choice. I know some stuff, like I've talked about, I'm taking teleportation circle as soon as I can, because I don't think anyone else can immediately take that as fast as I can. And mm -hmm. once I have that, that opens up the world to the highest standard. Oh. That'll also, be a very good time. Random thought. How bad of a decision would it be if purely because he thought it was interesting, Flux multiclassed into Bard? <laughs> <laughs> to Bart. That'd be really, really funny. It's a, it's a full caster. It wouldn't cost you slots. It just depends on how much you want the uh, the early levels of Bard's bonuses. Because there's some skill checks in there. You could take expertise, uh, which will help you get stuff on your crafting later on. Ooh, that is true. That is true. Because, yeah, thankfully, as an artificer, if I gain like any kind of proficiency in a tool, I'm also an expert in it. Mm. But man, go multi-classing into something where I have seven charisma. Yeah, you'd have to do a three-level dip if you wanted expertise, and that would let you add expertise to even more of your abilities. Oh, that'd be sweet. <laughs> I've I've heard of Warforged uh building uh instruments into their body so as to be able to play by smacking themselves. The only question I would ask you is what's Flux's charisma? <laughs> Yeah. Seven. I don't Most think you spells. can multi-class. <laughs> that makes sense. I think you need to have at least 12 in order to become a bard. <laughs> Oof. That's good. It's good that something would stop this terrible decision. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know I know. in the multi-classing sheet somewhere it tells you the minimum stats you need if you ever want to multi-class into something. Yeah. Which I don't think many people have ever really looked at because sometimes it's intuitive like if you have a negative con which you know would kill you but in mm -hmm. this magical universe where it hasn't um you can't be a barbarian obviously yeah fair, i think fair. a lot of people tend to pick fairly adjacent multi-classes like bard into warlock or vice versa uh, mm -hmm. yeah yeah stuff that has some synergy yeah i think very few people multi-class things that have almost no synergy so I think it's rare that people would need to look at the multi-class sheet to know if they were allowed to take a thing. Yeah. But yeah. Charisma is straight up my dump stat. <laughs> I'm sure you'd be a fine bard. <laughs> <laughs> I'd want to see it, but I don't think I'm willing to commit to nerfing myself quite so hard <laughs> just yeah, to see what would uh... happen. Minimum 13 in any given stat to multi-class. Oh, um, gotcha. So 13 charisma for bard, 13 strength for barbarian. It's not even con. You can be a, a low con barbarian if you chose. Um, and then some of them have multiple. Like monks, you need dex and wisdom. Paladins, you need strength and charisma. And ranger, you need dex and wisdom. Ah. 
Makes sense. You gotta yeah. have these things. Makes cool, sense. cool. Next question Neat. is for Mariam. You recently said that if you hadn't met Quintus, you would be with the real-lived Black Dragon Boy. What about them yep. is alluring to you, and would you ever change your allegiance situation? Uh, so, Mariam, as a whimsical person, is not caught up in a lot of the qualms of things. He'll call stuff out for what it is, like when uh, it's technically legal to hunt the highest standard, he was very vocal about okay, this still isn't right. Like, you as an entity, whatever guild is after us, knows that the person behind this contract hasn't revealed themselves, and you still choose to pursue it. Like, there's a level of understanding you have of, this is shady, but there's money to be made. Um, so, recognizing bad where bad is, he would see some of the bad in what is doing, but he'd have less scruples about it, because he's ultimately not worried about the bad side of things so without being allied to someone who's directly opposed to him uh mark wire says a lot of he i again like i said earlier he's great because he's right except for where he's critically wrong um mm -hmm. mark wire's ultimate like the ultimate end of his philosophy is a lot of the weak people in the city being crushed by the strong which is kind of where it is already the only difference is that uh, he would elevate some of the more commonly discriminated against races into positions where they can use whatever influence or power they have to really drag themselves out of where they are. But a lot of good people would be hurt by it. So I can't say he would stay with them forever, but the rhetoric itself is quite enticing to someone like Mariam, who's lived around like racism since forever. He would stay inside at po uh, points to not be around his brothers and sisters because he doesn't want them getting accosted for having a devil for a sibling. Um, so seeing people being based on their merit and skill, uh, even now, it, it like, Mariam kind of agrees with most of it, but at the end of the day, Mark Wire is going to hurt more people. So I can't mm -hmm. say he'd stay. He'd probably end up just moving on with his life. Um... But he would initially, yeah, he would he would like Mark Wire's radical. Mark Mar even called him out on that when we were fighting underground in a vault. He's like, y every time I say something, you seem to agree with it. Why are you not on my side? And Miriam didn't really give him a straight answer because there is no straight answer. He's like, eh, I don't like you. <laughs> it's really where he's at. You're, you showed you're, up second. <laughs> you're wrong somewhere, and you are opposed to Quintus, which means you're my enemy. Um. Because otherwise, yeah. Mariam would do fine. In a society Markwire is running, Mariam's not weak by any means. Like, they're sure someone like Markwire could run a train on him. But the average person in Summergrass, Mariam could pop like a freaking, like, fruit gusher. It would take not even a moment's, like, notice. Yeah. Uh, he's uh, vocally against things like the Academy. Um and the the church supporting it and the suppression of mages. Miriam's very pro magic, uh, because Miriam doesn't like to be collared or chained by anything other than the chains he gives himself. He's really the only one who can jail him is Miriam. And uh, I I will stand by it unless there is a reason. Like the, if I can Quintus' life relies on it, he would take the brand. But unless that's the case, in no universe would he would he would run, he would hide, he would fight and kill to not have to wear a collar or a brand. In no universe would he accept it. He is a person who values freedom amongst all else. <laughs> and uh, I require, I think, allies close-ish to that, enough so that with no allegiance to the highest standard, he would absolutely be like, yeah, you're all right. In the same way that Scandal is interested, or was interested in Markwire for a while, I think Marion would have a very similar experience of, yeah, I'll help you, and then after enough happens, he'd leave for, I think, more moral reasons than Scandal did, but he would, uh, he would, much like her, I think, tire of him at some point and be like, no, you, you're you the same thing in a d different phase. That makes sense. So context aside, because uh, I know that there's a lot of different contexts things can happen in that would change your answer to this question but to ask, mm -hmm. but context aside, is there any spell that you as Aaron know of 
that Miriam would cast, knowing it might risk the attention of someone who would want to give him a collar or a brand. Would cast depends on where. Yeah, that's uh, that comes down to context. Um, currently, I have no magic that could bring that attention. The strongest mm -hmm. spell Miriam has is polymorph, which hardly is gonna bring too much. Like Flint can just kind of do that with his B shapes. Um, so right now, the most flashy spell he has is like call lightning, mm -hmm. and call lightning definitely attracts attention, especially from a tiefling. Um, so there's in the right circumstances with a scared enough noble that could get him into trouble and Miriam wouldn't really hesitate to use it he uh, even in his fight with Quintus he did it solely because call lightning is a showy spell and people are like we want a show he's like here's a show have a lightning storm mm -hmm. um so like but, let's say you get to higher levels where you have other spells and other magic especially with the secrets that you can get from other classes you could hypothetically access the showiest spells at a certain point uh yeah um is is there something is there something that's big on that list that you would want to cast that might get you in trouble that would might be worth getting in trouble for i want to get disintegrate at some point so that's probably one Ooh. that uh that, that probably would, uh, would. <laughs> that would definitely have people be like hey none of that um that's right around the level like that's I think it's around six level spells that the attention is super warranted. I know Logan mentioned as much for uh, what is it investiture of ice, which I think Fenris has in her hammer. That's like that's riding the cusp and that's around where disintegrate is if I remember right. Um, beyond that, I, I've never I, to be honest, I've never put a ton of thought into it because uh, I, I never plan on living through a session like I always <laughs> yeah, I go in attempting to obviously and for the most part that's always been true um, but uh, I definitely ride every session I survive as another victory that makes sense so uh, yeah I mean I like I want to get all the general bard stuff I want to get my magnificent mansion which mm -hmm. I'll have to spend some time thinking about what Merriam's is going to look like but that's going to be red um, and, uh, you know, if I get there, I get there, but, uh, my end game is, you know, them juicy, like wish level spells. Mm -hmm. I've always wanted to play with, um, Demi plane. Ooh, yeah. Ooh. That's a good one. Such a fascinating it spell. It is, it is a really, you just create a universe. Like you make the rules now and mm -hmm. it's, uh. It's such kind of an overlooked spell, but that's right. I think that's a was that seventh level. It's up there. It's a seventh or eighth level, I think. Uh, and it's uh, you're just starting to touch reality bending magic. Like that's where magnificent mansion stuff exists, where you can be like, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, here's my demi plane where gravity doesn't exist or something. <laughs> and just, that them's the rules here. Uh, that's where you start encroaching on the realm of gods, which is a long, long ways away. But there's stuff like, I don't think Marion would have qualms with using, although I don't know if he would, if he got spells like Magic Jar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's I think the whole he, thing. In the right situation, if he had access to it, he'd be like, yeah, I'll use that, hell yeah. <laughs> like, what do you mean? It's a great spell. <laughs> you, could, you could do some real good and real bad with a spell like that. Um, more often bad than not, but, you know, Marion was a good guy for the most part. Yeah. Additional similar question for Flux, because uh, Flux has not been around for super long. Is is Flux aware that this is a thing? That making something sufficiently magical will get you in real serious trouble? I would imagine so. Like, that's not, like, a secret, as far as right. I'm aware. Like, people, there's such a fear of magic in this world that somebody at some point would have told him, uh, yeah, if you, if you... If you cast too big a spell, some people might notice, and they're not going to like that. So let's take you to the happy magic island, where you get to not leave. <laughs> yeah, like, I mean, he works directly with magic as an artificer, so at some point, I imagine somebody mentioned, don't make, like, a magic nuke, for example. People might not like a magic nuke. That yeah. might be, like, that might count as, like, above fifth level magic. Yeah, that's, that's fair. Is there anything that uh, is there anything that Flux is concerned about making that might be powerful enough to get him attention? I don't 
think so. Because like sees a magic nuke. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> like, I know you were talking about the airship that you wanted to make. Are you concerned that that is sufficiently powerful to get you in trouble? Hard to say, because, like, mechanically speaking, an artificer only ever gets fifth level stuff. So, mm. without going into, like, stuff I'd have to get, like, Logan's approval on, mechanically, I wouldn't be in danger of crossing that threshold. But yeah, I imagine if we started building stuff that, that that's such a much large enough scale, like an airship, I think there's at least a chance someone might raise an eyebrow at that. Yeah, if we're up I, I'd be inclined to agree. I think, uh, especially uh, the only context ever airships in D and D spell jammers, and those things are ridiculously like just for speed alone worth the attention, let alone the fact that it's a flying boat. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Uh, Do you think that it's possible that Flux being a Warforged might eventually become a thing that is, like, worth the attention? That, like, do you think you'll get person rights under that circumstance? Or do you think you'll get object rights under that circumstance? Um, from what I understand, Warforged are treated exactly like, uh, citizens. They're, uh... Okay. They're That's actually good. treated a whole lot better than, like, the druidic races, as is my understanding. Like, people don't look at Warforged the same way they look at, like, a tiefling. I think they're a lot more cool with, uh, with them generally. Okay. That's, that's nice. That's a good time. Indeed. All right. I was just curious about a bunch of stuff. Uh, yeah. I got next written question is for Flux. Dear Flux, have you ever thought of giving yourself sword hands? Additionally, if you had slash gave yourself a last name, what would it be? Hmm. So sword hands every day. Yes. <laughs> Who wouldn't? I mean, when you have the potential to have a completely modular body. Yeah. It's going to, the thought crosses your mind. <laughs> maybe I could be like. You take advantage of that. But maybe, maybe a better way to go knife fingers because then you maintain some level of manual dexterity and also more knives mm -hmm. yeah, and yeah. then you can threaten people by giving them the tickles <laughs> the fiendish tickles Wonderful. and yeah sorry what was the other question if you had uh if you had a last name or you were to give yourself a last name what would it be interesting because yeah Maybe Coeus, but that, I don't think he would ever give himself that name because it's his master's last name and without some way of contacting the dead, she couldn't give it to him. Yeah. So, yeah, I, th I think he would, he would definitely accept that in the bizarre situation where it came up, but if he had to give himself one, uh, hmm. It's meaningful to him. Eventually, he might do something like Flux Standard. Hmm. After the highest standard. I don't Flux think he... highest dash standard for a combined last name. <laughs> I don't think he would ever feel comfortable adding the highest part of it, because that, <laughs> that just seems braggy and perhaps not accurate to his abilities. He, he wouldn't feel comfortable with that. Standard, standard is something he can live up to. Standard is repeatable. <laughs> That's entirely fair. Next question is for Miriam and Flux. What would be the perfect gift you would love to receive from someone? Ooh. A smooch. Oh. Um, I don't know. Wine, <laughs> silk sheets. Uh, Miriam likes lavish things um, because while he doesn't care about money, part of the reason he doesn't is that Miriam's adapted to appearing to live an aristocratic lifestyle. Um, and in doing so, the one thing he is aware of is that if you are rich enough, you don't care about money. Um, so things like that definitely tickle his fancy. He lives for that kind of high life. Um, but yeah, at the same time, good company is always nice. Spa day slash good company. 
Mm-hmm. It's a good time. And uh, Flux? Probably some sort of bizarre contraption that he, he could just figure out, like a puzzle. Hmm. Like, give him homework and he will be happy. <laughs> I, I just now realized that Flux is the kind of person who's like, teacher, you didn't give us homework. 100%. I he just, see. He sees facts as neutral. He doesn't really take into consideration how people might feel about facts before he just says them. Ah. Gotcha. Yeah. Seven charisma, everybody. Yeah, that's that's entirely fair. <laughs> Next question is for Miriam. Uh, can you go into great detail, please? What exactly is a devil's three-way? Is there anything more to it than just the obvious? Nope, it is just the obvious, the joke being that I'm the devil. Ah. Uh, <laughs> fair that's enough. Fair. Uh, the regular requirements for a Devil's Through Eight also apply. Uh, but beyond that, just as long as two dudes are involved, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. If one's a devil, even better. <laughs> or that's, devilish, that I guess not really a fiend. Yeah, that, that seems that seems at least somewhat required for, for it to be a Devil's yeah. Three Way. It makes it it go it makes it from like a kind of a gross line to a oh hi, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> like it's still kinda gross. Like if if two dudes rolled up and one was a tiefling and they're like, you read a devil's through it, it's still a little like Ugh. but you're at least like, ah, there's a punchline here, rather than ah, uh, two men asking me if I've ever slammed two men at the same time. <laughs> 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 Adorable. <laughs> What happens if all three are tieflings? All three are tieflings? That's mm -hmm. the true devil's three way. Much like resurrection and true resurrection. AKA <laughs> the only trinity. Form of the same. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's, that's totally fair. Uh, next question is for Flux. Dear Flux, have you picked up on any faults in your AE-35 unit? Hmm, any faults? Well, let's see. Could definitely do with more spell slots. Like, I, I've got some, some, some good spells in my arsenal. They're, they lag a little bit behind true, like, full casters. Mm -hmm. But uh, he can get some good stuff done. But he does d very much lack in quantity of spell slots. Like... One of his go-to strategies, like when he was fighting Murkwire and Keen, was just to really cheese his AC with uh, with <laughs> stuff like shield. And as a Warforged, he also gets uh, a dish, uh, plus one AC from any armor he's wearing. And as an Artificer, he's allowed to wear medium armor. Mm -hmm. So I was getting upwards of like 25 AC or 26, something like that, when... Uh, <laughs> when using a shield but uh yeah he does require spell slots for a lot of his stuff like he can't summon his turret more than once without a spell slot so once those resources are exhausted he's really much he's kind of just down to cantrips which as uh as his fight with keen will show is not especially effective <laughs> it's a little bit of a pea shooter by that point so that's a that's a flaw that could could use some some adjustment. So you want you want the AE three five unit to get good. Indeed, indeed, it could really do with a hefty dose of get good. I understand. Mm -hmm. Next question is for both of y'all, you Miriam and Flux. Do you have any core concepts in mind when designing your characters from a roleplay perspective? What did you want out of them? It's more for the players, but still. Mm -hmm. That's fair, yeah. Um, I mostly just try to think of something that would, like, just have a fun energy when bouncing off of the rest of the players, because, like, mm -hmm. just 
the role play stuff where we like don't even accomplish anything we just talk back and forth for like four hours or some of the best sessions and having some like fun personality quirks that lead to like really fun interesting conversations is so good yeah i guess coming in as a new character in the campaign you really get the benefit of kind of knowing what you're walking into so you can design parts of yourself around the party effectively before mm. you even arrive mm -hmm. trying to see like all right what what kind of like character archetype are we missing that might have some fun back and forth here i uh my okay. was having no design philosophy i uh I didn't experiment. Uh, I've been kind of talking about it for a hot minute beforehand, but I've always wanted to be more hands-off with my character and not plan much of anything at all. So there is uh, one aspect of Merriam that I I added directly without any influence of anything else, and I won't talk about that. Um, <laughs> but that's just backstory stuff. Uh, for the actual character and everything else, uh, Logan challenged me to be a social boy this campaign. That was a direct thing. He's like, I want you to be more of a talky boy. And I was like, all right, bard me. Because I knew I wanted to be either a bard, a sorcerer, a barbarian, or a druid, I think were my choices. Ooh. And so he mirrored that. And once I was like, I'm able to charisma, and I thought sorcerer or bard, and then he gave me talky, so that made it real easy. Um... After that, I rolled almost everything about him. Like, there was a few tweaks here and there, and Logan provided some input about things he'd like to see, um, or, like, we just... Sometimes we got some ridiculous stuff, because I'd use the Xanathar's Guide, a little, like, this is your life, and you just roll to find out details about your character. Some stuff was incongruent with the rest of it, where it was, like, uh, I had the urchin background, and I had, like, a poor life um, as uh, a kid, uh, like, we weren't rich by any stretch uh, at all. Um, but uh, one of the things that we I rolled was, like, I lived in a really nice house. Or like, <laughs> something like that. It's like, yeah, let's maybe move that towards something less less that, because that does not make sense. <laughs> or I think I rolled, like, I had a really average childhood. He's like, yes, you, the tiefling, had an average child. <laughs> um, but otherwise, yeah, basically all of it was random. Um, uh, I can't even think of, yeah, I, I think I picked tiefling as like, just, uh, I haven't been one and that'll be fun. And other than yeah. that, it was, uh, my philosophy was being hands off as much as possible and just seeing what happens as we go in. Um, I knew to a degree that I would be kind of a horny bard because I've talked about this a lot on stream and I, I've said it on my own streams as well. Uh, <laughs> someone made like a long Reddit post about the horny bard memes, which I do get like their frustration with them. Uh, you know, it's like bard fucks dragon or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I, I understand that they're quite ubiquitous and they're uh, low hanging fruit as far as bard jokes can go. But they tried to exclaim on the internet that there is no possible world in which a horny bard can be an interesting character. And that made uh -huh. me angry. So I made a horny <laughs> bard. Aside from the fact that there's ones that are already notoriously successful, like Scanlan and Critical Role, it's just, uh, it was a weird take that I decided, screw you, person on the internet. I'll prove you wrong by playing one in a game you'll never see. <laughs> so take that. That'll learn them. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can't help but feel that um, a, lot of the, a lot of the tropes that get a lot of shit in D, D are traditionally things that can be handled very poorly in in the hands of somebody that doesn't plan to make them any more than the trope yeah. uh yeah. I, I think that you know not every D, &D role player has the same level of experience not every dm has the same level of experience not every table likes the same style of gameplay or there, there's so many different modular ways to play tabletop rpgs and that's just in the scope of 5th edition or any similar system that, you know, Shadowrun is inherently very different than a of lot course. of other, like, fantasy games. And there's there's so many different caveats to everything that I feel it's a bit of a disservice to say X archetype, X trope character is never going to work. Uh, there's going to be a game in which that 
that trope excels or is very good. It's also a uh, trope mishandled frequently. Yeah. It doesn't mean that the trope is bad. It just means people don't use it right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And I, I, I very much respect when a group or like a, a set of people are like, I am not going to allow this trope in my games or at my tables because of all of the problems it has had or because we don't handle it right or whatever. I'm totally fine with that. But to just blanket statement, this is never going to it's work. It's impossible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's <laughs> probably not. Awesome. That, that's a, a habit people, especially on the internet, have. Um, yeah. And as much as I'll begrudgingly make characters despite them, <laughs> I don't really much care about their being in the long run because they're never going to do that. It's like playing evil characters. Uh, I think yeah. it's super doable, but there are plenty of tables where someone's like, I'm an evil character. That means I need to steal from the party and stab them all behind yeah. their backs. <laughs> and that's, of course, never the case. Like, one of the most famous evil characters of all time is Reislin, who is up until a point, there is a critical breaking point where he is now a villain and he's clearly at odds with the party, but that tension is what makes it interesting and fun. Uh, and the build to that is where it is, because ultimately having something that makes sure your evil character isn't going to be evil at the party is what uh, is what's important. And of mm -hmm. course, every table needs... It, there, there's a lot in a social contract in a D and D game. Yeah, and uh, what everyone wants at the table needs to be taken into account, especially when doing something like that. Because, well, I can't call it experimental because everyone's done it at some point or another. Like any veteran in D and D has talked about the time that they've all did evil characters or they had like an evil one in the group, and there's varying stories of success and failure. Um, I think a lot of it is knowing who's at the table. If someone's gonna play like Paladin, Mick, Light Nuts. Uh, maybe don't have an evil character at the table because that is yeah. going to be instant conflict that might not be healthy. Making sure, or or if you can, do, again, what uh, Dragonlance did and make the evil character the paladin's brother. <laughs> then they can't <laughs> kill each other. Like it's, it's, sometimes that's all you need to do. But if you know it's going to cause player tension, then obviously you want the healthiest game possible. Um, yeah, I, I'm all for the sort of romance idea of a bunch of strangers meet in a bar and then the adventure unfolds like i i like that sort of classic idea but it does not always work and there are issues with it i've been if... in love with having characters come in logan we did it for this campaign and i think i kind of want to do it for most of my ones going forward is having everyone come in groups even if they're yeah. not all knowing each other right out the gate having everyone have some pre-existing relationship with at least one other party member makes role play just pop right out the gate because you have someone mm. to play off of and uh instead of the awkward sitting around hello i am the fighter i stab real good what do mm. you do man in robes <laughs> <laughs> i think the only thing i want to add on to that and i i just want to add it on for the sake of clarification uh i think it's good to have people show up in groups and those groups to have strong pre-established bonds that are very clear and determined beforehand to an extent mm -hmm. of like, we are best friends for like Quinn and uh, Miriam. Like we're practically brothers. Like that is a good, well-defined way to show up in a group instead of we worked together one time. Oh like, yeah. That mm -hmm. uh, when you have people show up in groups, those groups should probably already very much like each other and trust each other near implicitly. Uh, because I have had games where people show up in groups and the the bonds were far too ill-defined. It and was just loosely, you know it, each yeah. other. Uh, you I met, think you yeah. met once, that's it. Like, There's a... Uh, make it a little more. It's a mixed bag with it, because I, I love it all. Like, in Vestige, what I loved was we had two solid groups of clearly, like, BFFs, Lexi and Fenris, and uh, Quintus and Merriam were just solid out the gate. And then Vogan and Raleigh having this kind of like we've saved each other's lives and we work together quite well we've been traveling for a while now but they both kind of hate each other mm -hmm. <laughs> so having that tension right out the gate and it only got yeah. like worse and worse as we went on and mm -hmm. i i was living for that up until raleigh <laughs> left it was so good just the yeah. the constant like are they gonna kiss or fight and i'm there for That's either really <laughs> That's fair. Yeah, that's that's honestly I, a fair addendum. I I'll say to revise. Uh, my that's thought, knowing your own players and yeah. 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 I, I, I would say have something wrong. that that brings good prolonged chemistry. 
between the groups. Why do I have a hair scrunchie on my desk? This is a good <laughs> question. Just in case. Oh, I have short hair. It's a present <laughs> for you. That's a oh. treat. In what you guys were saying, like, when playing an evil character, like, don't, like, steal from the party. It's like, that's the first <laughs> thing I did when trying to be an evil character. I even so what happened there was you grabbed loot much like with Fenris this is one thing that uh, I, I kind of ribbed people for because everyone's like my goodness all you did was take loot without telling people which isn't explicitly stealing it's not like it was ours it was in a treasure chest um, it was that there was an implicit feeling of guilt from the person taking it <laughs> and the party knew and so like oh you're holding out on us but holding out is not theft mm -hmm. much like when Fenris took the gloves and everyone razzed her being like you were so on Raleigh about that but then you did I'm like had the uh, opposite happened and either of you walked up to the item and held it up in the sky you're like I am wearing this everyone would have been like yeah okay and they would have moved it would have done off. so much better it God is damn. uh it is a weird place between staking claim and just picking it up and people caring about yeah. it I uh <laughs> was not prepared as a as a character Merriam didn't care because he wasn't interested in either item and frankly he he's not exactly a stranger to theft so he's like whatever mm -hmm. uh and as a player uh i thought it was hilarious so i didn't <laughs> care either way oh yeah i was maybe not prepared to play an evil character it's like oh god everyone everyone hates the thing i did that works against their interests who knew no, I, uh, mm -hmm. I was howling that whole time <laughs> oh it's it, oh, i'd say it was, the... it was a good learning experience though i think what i like to play time. I'm sorry. No, that's fine. Uh, I feel like the the best way to introduce evil characters from my personal experience is to have all of the evil characters want the same thing and work for the same organization so that there's yeah, something yeah, I mean, to stop them from going completely off the rails mm -hmm. and having any one of them try to TPK the rest of them. Uh, yeah. yeah. That's, that's probably for the best because I've had... I've been I've been playing since like 2008. Uh, it's it's been a lot of experiences of one dude is real evil and goes way overboard and then gets real mad in in real life when all of the other characters respond accordingly or there are consequences yes. for their actions. I think uh, and that's not great. <laughs> the coming from the the GM's perspective, it definitely becomes uh, making sure the right people are doing it. And an all evil campaign, that's uh, generally, you know, those should, I think, be one shots in my personal opinion, because, yeah. or at least a, like a short campaign. You would, you don't want to run a, a multi-year long all evil campaign because eventually mm -hmm. alliances will form and people will have to move away. But with a short one, you can kind of, like, I think Matt Colby's the Suicide Squad example of, you know, if they all have collars, even if they all hate each other and want to kill each other, if their head explode, if they don't work together then they can all push and do this evil thing while all still being evil together um but uh yeah i i'm very a fan of I... the uh the evil voice of reason mm -hmm. is where i like to go where they talk about the merits of not necessarily the good course of action um but i feel like we're getting sidetracked yeah, yeah, I, I'll just share very quickly that the one good evil game that I was in, every single player was playing a worshiper of Asmodeus, and as a caveat to enter the game, your character had to already have sold their soul uh, as a part of some other thing, so hmm. you're now doing this. So ah. there's the there's that sort of Suicide Squad collar thing mixed in with, you know, everybody being probably lawful enough to follow some rules of some sort and not go completely uh off the rails and that was like a multi-year campaign that was very fun we ended yeah. at like level 14 or so oh, hell yeah. uh that was that was a good time that there was some structure to it but yeah anyway i agree we're very sidetracked i've just had fun talking about this <laughs> yeah uh, i'm gonna go through the last couple questions and uh and then we will play the game of the highest stakes ever conceived uh Aww. next question is for Miriam. Dear Miriam, what is the order of smoochability of each of your party members? Oh man, they're all so hot. Um. Yes, is my answer. No, um, um Miriam. So Miriam was into Raleigh very briefly until he found out Raleigh might have killed his dad. Fair, Fair reason Fair. to not be into someone, I guess. He has smooched Quinn. Mm -hmm. 
Um, he has moved Fenris. So excluding them just because he already has, but you know, he'd still smooch again, I guess. Um, well, he wouldn't smooch Quinn again. He'd be like, unless we were both smooching someone. It's not like he, he's not, he, he's not in love with Quinn. He loves Quinn. He's not in love with Quinn. Um, he's, uh, yeah, he's kind of hit on everyone. Avi's really hot. He's, um, he's kind of flirted with Alexia a bit, who's, um, actively, uh, actively limboed under that bar. I'm like, no, I'm not talking about that. Um, uh, but to, to try and literally organize them in any order, I don't know. He's kind of kind of smooching in their all general direction. I'd say if he's not going to smooch anyone, it's Flux because he's directly talked to Flux about, hey, do you even have those kind of feelings? And Flux is like, not really. He's like, cool, all right. That's all I needed to know. <laughs> Fair. Would you and like me to explains. install them? <laughs> I could learn these things. Pulls out CD. Um, <laughs> Inserts into mouth. Yeah, no, he's uh, he's a bit interested in on a, on a passive level with most people. He's definitely uh, he's definitely into Lexi. Uh, he's actively told Aviana he'd smooch her and Rory if they didn't kiss. Um, but uh, he's not. I guess if he had to pick between those two, he'd want to smooch Lexi more because he's known her longer. And Mariam doesn't trust anyone who doesn't really know. And the more you save his life, the more he's like, ah, you're probably not a horrible person. <laughs> <laughs> um, but at this point, everyone in the party saved his life generally, at least once or twice. Uh, so he's uh, he's been able to fast track that level of distrust he would normally have as a tiefling. Um, Fenris he still really likes. He's very happy that she's doing the, the horizontal hug uh, with someone that she cares about. Um, but he's he's not about to ruin their good thing if she wants to to smotch after they break up, then hell yeah. <laughs> but it's probably not gonna happen, so he's not worried about it. Uh but yeah, Lyra's a barge, she's extremely attractive, but he really wants her to kiss Quintus, so she's kind of off the table. Uh Almira. Almira's really hot. Uh <laughs> he uh he, he would. But my God, would she not? So that's also that's as a player, I'm aware that's off the table. Uh, he's not into Mary Mist um, because as much as she's really cute, and he probably would if it came up. He knows a it won't, and b he doesn't like the cold, so Aww. he he feels like he wouldn't be really be into it uh, the whole way. So he he just wouldn't try. That's fair. A near omnidirectional smooch cannon of a boy. Yeah. So his biggest focus, I guess, right now, because most people are either taken or doing something, Avi and Avi and Lexi are the people he'd be the smoochiest at right now. Heck yeah. Totally yes, fake. Yes. Next question for Flux. Uh, <laughs> this kind of came up a little bit, but dear Flux, as it hasn't been described uh, what emotions, what the full scope of emotions you can and can't feel, uh, do you think you could fall in love? And if so, which member of the highest standard do you think you would fall in oh love for? Goodness. Yeah, Flux has been a little weird, because, like, as a Warforged, he biologically can feel emotions, but I think for whatever reason, those, like, connections in his brain don't always line up right. Like, he doesn't always understand what he's feeling, or he might feel the wrong thing at the wrong time. Like, he'll, he might not be super sad if someone dies in front of him, and then other times he'll be enraged by it. Mm -hmm. still kind of figuring out like how to feel things properly so i wouldn't say that it could never happen but it would definitely be purely an emotional thing because he i can say with certainty he has no sex drive <laughs> that is something unless one were installed obviously. indeed yes if if someone were to request such a thing he would happily oblige he would figure out how he could install such a thing on his person but if it were just on him to, like, make a move, I think, yeah, he would probably, yeah, he would, he would probably just want to be really good friends with people. Mm. Yeah. But who knows? I, I won't rule it out. You never know how this boy might evolve. That is fair. Yeah. Got two more questions left. Next question is for Flux. Dear Flux. How were you able to use blood as ammunition? Apparently, he used blood as ammunition. I didn't know that. 
Oh, uh, that was a fun time. So, one of the spells that I was really excited to try out when I got Lux was Catapult. Uh -huh. And uh, we were we were attempting to save some people from these cultists who were trying to kind of slit their throats and drain their blood into like troughs and barrels and things. And uh, during the fight, uh, it seemed um, like this barrel that happened to be sitting around might make a good uh, might make a good target for this catapult spell. And it was only after I had done it that I learned that it was full of blood. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, it became a bit of a horrifying looking situation real quick. But it was pretty, pretty fun. Okay, when that question first showed up, I thought it was just, like, loose. Like, just chilling. <laughs> like, without a container. Just, like, just someone ground. give me your veins and I'll just fire their juices at people. Like, I got, like, just a blood bag that I've hooked up to, like, a squirt gun latched into my arm. Yeah, I was I was kind of confused about that for a second, just to be honest. But, yeah, that's that's fair. So it's just catapult and you launch the barrel. Yeah. It okay. took me off guard for a second, too, and then I rem remembered. That is understandable. <laughs> okay, last question is for Miriam. Dear Miriam. Who do you think the spooky man in the mist is? Um, I, I have no reasonable way to answer that. So currently, Strahd von Zerovich. Oh. <laughs> that's not, a guy that likes the mist. That's who I'm going with. Well, we've seen some some Barovia esque things around. Uh, specifically, well, we've seen we've seen we've seen uh, we've seen Tatia. <laughs> that's really it. <laughs> um, there's uh there's one other thing I could say that could point me kind of in the Barovia direction. Logan's also confirmed that Ravenloft and Barovia as a concept exist in the world, uh, as is. Um, I think at one point I can't remember, so don't don't quote me on this. But I mm -hmm. think uh, I think he confirmed that the uh, whatever entity that Strahd is uh, in this world and the Crystal Queen are like at least aware of each other. Is they're both effectively like vampire lords. Um, but uh, while Barovia esque something wouldn't be exactly viciously far off, uh, I I have no there's there's no name I could slap out there that would be like yes I know who this is he is he is spooky grandpa um, until he tells me who he is. And uh, until then, Spooky Grandpa is also Strahd Von Zarevich. <laughs> Spooky Grandpa Strahd Von Zarevich. I'm, I'm yeah. here for Who really it. wants this tiefling nephew to show up and be like, hello, bring about the apocalypse, please. If you wouldn't mind as a fun if, favor to me. <laughs> if, if that's not too much of a, a stretch for you. All you need to do is die so I can talk to your soul and tell you to do the apocalypse thing. You know the unfortunate part about having a whole destiny about bringing the apocalypse is that I, I can be like, oh, well, I, I need to die so I don't do that. But what if me dying is the thing that triggers that event? Yeah, you and gotta watch out for that. that. <laughs> Stupid prophecies. Mm -hmm. You never know which way they're gonna zig or zag. <laughs> One of those prophecies that won't happen if you don't try and prevent it. It's bogus. <laughs> 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 I mean, All right. I have, uh, I have no idea. There's, there's no answer I can give to that. I have counted and double checked, and we have a seven questions among these that were asked by your fellow players. And with that, I will give you each four guesses uh, to try to find them all. And we are going to start with easy ah fuck i'm so bad at this the okay. game has the highest stakes ever conceived which is inspiration if you are oh, able to guess correctly uh which of these questions was guessed by one of, was submitted by one of your fellow players uh you will receive a point of inspiration if hmm. you further guess which player submitted it you'll get an additional point of inspiration and if a player's question goes unguessed 
and that player will receive a point of inspiration. So Izzy's taking the lead. Feel free to read through. Okay. Get a vibe. Yeah, I'm looking through my, my list here. Which of these has our group's vibes going on? Um, I'm going to take a shot in the dark and say the question about how long it'll be before we just make friends with the Tenebros. Let me see. Oops. All right. I want to find that question. All right. So the question was, Dear Mary and the Flux, thoughts on Tenebros and Stradivarius? Future friend, maybe? A uh, matter of time before everyone forgives him for all, uh, slash them for the things they have done, etc. That question was not asked by one of your fellow players. Heck. And with that, both of you must get every guess correct from this point forward, or your fellow <laughs> players will receive inspiration. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> I can't have them have inspiration. That's horrible for me. I you know. can't allow it to happen. And I have you must question. rob them of this opportunity. Aaron, take your shot to rob them. I have one question for you. Okay. How many questions have you received from the players today? Today? Uh, yes. seven. Hmm. Every single one of them was received today. You got today. them all today. Yes. Uh. You were hoping to try to see who would wait till the last second, I assume. No, so the reason I ask is that I believe the the later that's the less they're thinking about it immediately, the mm -hmm. more likely they're gonna ask a question of both of us at the same time, rather than an individual question each. Mm -hmm. Um so I was I was I was trying to sneakily find out if there was more likely to be a um a thing from both of them. Uh, which it's still my, uh, it's still kind of where I'm leaning. Um, that. I mean, I'm gonna I'm be real. This one, even though this is, goes against everything I was just talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, Dear Miriam, what is the order of smoochability of each of your party members? Okay. Yeah, that question. That one. Is Dear Miriam, what is the order of smoochability of each of your party members? That question was indeed asked by one of your fellow players <laughs> on that oh. team. Well done. Who do you think asked that question? They're smooch goblins. Of course it was uh. there. If I had to guess, problem is I have one in my brain right now and I don't know if this is like 40 chests and someone's trying to fuck with me. Mm -hmm. But I'm gonna I'm gonna give it to them because if if that's the case, then they deserve this inspiration. I think Carrie asked that. That question was not asked by Carrie. Ah, ah. That question was submitted. That question was submitted by Hayden. Yeah, ah. they were on the list. It was either her, and then if it wasn't her, it was gonna be uh, Spanky trying to make me think it was her. Or <laughs> Carrie. <laughs> A good time. So, with that, we are back over to Izzy. Oh, heck. He got a heck. Oh. Uh, yeah, I had a good feeling about that order of smoochability. But I don't feel similarly about many of these other ones. Hmm. Oh, how about uh, Flux, would you wander off into the woods if someone told you? Okay, let me check that one. That question. You've proven yourself to be very obedient, at least when it comes to the highest standard. Uh, if one of them told you to wander off into the woods and never come back, would you, asking for a friend? That question was indeed asked by one of your fellow players. <gasps> now, now is boy, who asked that question? Was it Spanker? That question was not asked by Spanker. Damn! That had such Spanker energy to me, damn. Unsurprisingly, if not Spanker, the person who submitted it was <laughs> Carrie. <laughs> oh, fucking course. Uh. She's gonna get me killed. <laughs> <laughs> but yay, I'm not sure if I've ever gotten this right before. You did it! I'm proud! Ha <laughs> ha! 
so far, you guys are, are on track to guess all of the remaining questions submitted. And we are back over to Aaron. This one... Uh, see, I'm, I'm trying to think of which players would try and make it seem obvious that it's not them. Assuming they asked. And if it is... We've got two. There's, what, six ass by them, so there's four left. Give it your best think. I believe in you. I'm narrowing down how many there could be and who they could be from. <laughs> trying to do brain maths, but I'm not good Back at it because I'm not a smart boy. Math. Only I had a V8, <laughs> so I can drink terrible tomato taste and ass juice, <laughs> but it would make me smart. Oh, God. Uh, this is, uh, th this is literally just me going with my gut. I have nothing else to go on immediately, and I, it keeps catching my eye when I scan through everything. Um, dear Maram, can you go into exact detail, please? What exactly is the Devil's Three Way? Okay. Mm. That question, dear Miriam, can you go into great detail, please? What exactly is Devil's Three Way? Is there anything more to just anything more to it than just the obvious? That question was asked by one of your fellow players, Zico, <laughs> and it was Hell Cody. Yeah. You are totally accurate. <laughs> Uh, very correct of you. <laughs> <laughs> and with well that, we are done. back over to the Is Boy. Oh, you, fuck, you, can we I not? think this is one of the most successful rounds <laughs> of this most highest stakes game. I think y'all have so far been nailing it. Oh, and here's where the turn happens. <laughs> uh, are we allowed to ask? Uh, were people allowed to submit more than one question, like the, the players? Yes. Okay. Okay. So that could that could color some of these a bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Maybe I'm perhaps leaning toward the perfect gift. Oh. Is that your guess? Is that your final answer? Mm. Is it your final answer? <laughs> Trying to see how I feel about it after saying it out loud. How does it feel on the inside boy. place? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do I immediately regret saying it? I'm not sure. Heck. Uh... Yeah, let's, let's say... Let's say perfect gift. Okay. Dear Miriam and Flux, what would be the perfect gift you would love to get from someone? That question was not asked by one of your fellow players. The, the string of correct guesses has been broken. I failed you! And with that, we are over to Aaron. I've got two of you. Let's see if I can make it three of you. Hmm. Will Aaron come out of this as the ultimate question picker? Probably not, but let's let's go with it. Um so that one's a possible. There's what? We got three of them. And there were six questions, so there's three left. The ones we've got so far were... It's 
smooch ability. Devil's three way. And what was the other one? Wandering off into the woods. Wandering off. Hmm. I'm gonna say up that could be anybody which is why it would be a really good question with players let's say uh dear mary with flux what do you think your character's theme song would be all right once a toss up i can't say for sure oh, yeah. but i'm gonna lock Going in anyways. that one locking in Hi. so dear mary with flux what do you think your character's theme song would be the uh first question asked of the day uh that question was not asked by one of your fellow players on net 19 uh, that one is like anyone could ask yeah. it and i'm like that would be a really good one to ask if you didn't want to get mm -hmm. caught with that you each have one guess remaining and there are four questions yet unpicked four i was wrong you have guessed three correctly thus far that leaves four remaining. So, with one guess left each, it is easy. Uh, do you what do is boy? Uh, Activate so your Sizzler sensors. Activating them, putting them up to full strength. Do I got what it takes? Uh. Hmm. How about... How about Flux? Did your master make you or repair you? Hmm. That question... Dear Flux, did your master find you or made you? Uh, that question... As your final guess... Uh, game with the highest stakes ever conceived that question was not asked by one of your fellow players we were doing so good too ah! Aaron with the final guess of this game and four questions remaining do you what do um Dear Miriam, love doesn't seem to be your game. Okay. Locking it. Dear Miriam, love doesn't seem to be your game, at least not a singular love. That said, you are devoted to Quintus. Would you say that among those you've been with physically or otherwise, is Quintus the closest you come to loving as a brother or friend or perhaps more? That question, as the final guess of the game with the highest stakes ever conceived. So much stakes! Was not asked by one of your fellow players on the team. The questions which were asked by your fellow players were, Dear Flux, what sort of unique items do you look forward to making? And is there anything in particular you would want to uh, make for your party members? And that was submitted by Hayden. Aww. Additionally, I, I... there was, Dear Flux, now that you have a human face, when are you going to be hitting the dating scene? Wife. Damn. I and was that so was submitted sure. by Cody. I was just so sure that was just someone in the audience. Fuck. Surprise. Yet another one was, dear him, Rolexes, etc. During the whole incident with the necklace breaking, you seemed, I don't want to say suicidal, except I do, suicidal. What was the deal? And that was submitted by Carrie. Oh. And then lastly, the final question submitted, uh, very last second, which was added on, uh, was, dear Miriam, who do you think the spooky man in the mist is? And that was submitted by the Borp Bor person. It was the Borp Bor person. It was uh, the Borp Bor person. The love doesn't seem to be your game, just the way the periods were lined up. I was reading that basically as Fenris, and I was like, all right, bread. <laughs> That's where I was mm. in. You were down there being spooky, I see uh -huh. you, Brent Brennison. Hit it so well. Not watching Steins Gate. Ooh, we <laughs> Has she still not watched Steins Gate? She's, she's like almost halfway through. Oh, uh, okay. 
Well, she's too busy scary. being spooky. She's watching Frankenstein's Gate. Ooh wee, she gon' get it. Oh, we'll wow. strike her with a bolt of lightning. Oh no. <laughs> she resists that, I hear. <laughs> Uh, but thank you guys uh, so much for stopping by, answering all these wonderful questions submitted by these wonderful fans. And uh, fun to be thank you, yeah. many fans, for submitting so many wonderful questions. Uh, if you would like yeah. to, I think, thank you so much. If you would like to submit yet additional questions, you can do so at the uh, link underneath this video description right here. Uh, you can also go to our Twitch page and find the form to submit questions on there. And uh, next week, uh, not week, next month, uh, we will have yet additional guests. Uh, I, I am not quite sure who they are yet. I'm sure uh, I will be informed very soon upon saying this aloud. Quite but uh, next month there will be some lovely guests and you will find on the forum who they will be. Oh yes, I have been informed and I was just <laughs> negligent. Uh, I have found that it is Aviana and Logirn, the Logirn. Questions for the burb and the burb. Yes. If you burb have any questions cloud. for those lovely individuals, then feel free to use the form uh, below this video and or on the Twitch stream to submit them. Uh, thanks, everybody, so much. Uh, Aaron, where can people watching this find you? Uh, you can find me uh, on the regular days you find any Nat19 stuff. And if you're not there and it's a Tuesday or a Friday, you can find me at twitch.tv slash frozenfrost. Woo! And the is boy, where can people find you? Oh, they can find us on uh, something witty entertainment on uh, on YouTube or something witty gaming on YouTube and also Twitch. We. And I am uh, Chase, aka Coffin Jockey. You can find me on the Schmuck Squad YouTube, on the Grimjack YouTube, on the Schmuck Squad Twitch, uh, and then we have so very many Twitters they're hard to keep track of, but uh, the ones that I listed and also my own at Coffin Jockey. Uh, but thank everybody so much for watching along, for submitting questions, for interacting. The show is so much fun, and it's very special because of all the interaction we get from all you lovely people. Uh, so thank you so much for continuing to support the show by watching it and sending us your questions. Thank you so much. And we will catch you guys next month on Chat19! Yeah! Mwah! 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 Goodbye! Goodbye! Ah!